Charity. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a feature podcast of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and see it or download it in full. If you guys enjoy the show and want to support it and help me make it better, you can do so in two ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, uh, or you can simply make a donation. Today, my guest on the show is Dr. Stuart Armstrong. Stuart is a research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University, where he looks at issues such as artificial intelligence and existential threats. Stuart is also the author of a Kindle ebook titled Smarter Than Us, The Rise of Machine Intelligence, that I just finished reading. So, hi Stuart and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Fantastic. Stuart, let me ask you to introduce yourself in a few words for those of our viewers who may not be familiar with your work. Um, well, I started in mathematics, but uh, then transitioned to the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, where I've been looking at lots of things uh, all to do with, um, well, ensuring the survival and thriving of the human species uh, in the centuries to come, mainly. That, th that's very interesting. So, so tell me a little bit about that transition and, and what led to it. I mean, mathematicians are usually very accurate, very precise people. And then uh, it seems to me that you're kind of moving in a, a lot vaguer, kind of not mathematical and, and arguably even some mathematicians would dare to say not scientifically enough field. Um, they'd be correct. It is not a scientific field in the traditional sense because you can't do science with a lot of the things uh, that we have here. We can't sort of rush a million uh, asteroids uh, at a million different Earths and check uh, which ones uh, impact. So you have some tools of science and actually for asteroid impact you have a lot of tools of science and then you have um, at the other end of the scale you have artificial intelligence as my sort of most speculative risks, the one with the most uncertainties about. And in between you can arrange, say, synthetic biology, uh, nanotechnology, pandemics, super volcanoes on a scale of how scientific and how rigorous and how uncertain they are. Mm -hmm. But for your, your first question is that um, I got out of mathematics and into computational uh, biochemistry. <clears throat> So doing medicines, structures of medicines and things like that. And that was close to the FHI. And I hang around for a few years doing useful work for them. And uh, eventually they offered me a permanent job. That's fantastic. But why? That's the question. I mean, you had a very respectable scientific field with lots of good research and lots of progress made in, which is really core science. And now you're kind of moving away from it what was the motivation why the switch and I mean not to mention the fact that switching is is always uh, a hard process uh, and is kind of uh, it, it's a fresh start why kind of leave everything behind and move to a new entirely new field well what I like to say is that they got me by making me think of fun problems and uh, then they got, uh, they got me to care about them, so then I was trapped. Um, so to summarize, yes, uh, the mathematics is very rigorous and the computational biochemistry may have made a small difference to the world, but they're far less important uh, than these major, huge, uh, huge potential risks. And even a small, tiny impact on reducing one of those big risks is worth a lot more than sort of probably some of the best things I could reasonably have expected in biochemistry uh, and especially in mathematics. Mm, fantastic. I, I personally couldn't agree with you more. Uh, so I, I totally understand, uh, of course, the, the reasoning for that. But you already mentioned several times the existential risks so, and, and you even listed most of them. So let, let's rank just a couple of like let, what, what's the biggest risk in your experience and in your work? Okay, well, there's sort of four that we feel are sufficiently large and sufficiently 
um, under worked on that they are worth us considering. Um, their um, nuclear war, it's an old one, but it's still around. It's probably the fastest way um, to kill a lot of people today. Um, pandemics, the only sort of natural risk in the list. Mm -hmm. um, the pandemics are reasonably well understood and the probability distributions of them is really scary. Um, synthetic biology, uh, which I like to think of as pandemics plus potential human direction. Mm -hmm. And the one I said that we have the least understanding of, AI. Mm -hmm. Now, those, of those four risks, I would say the last two are the highest. Um, synthetic biology is the one that is the likeliest to cause to cause huge damage, say, this century. Mm -hmm. We're still probably talking about probabilities 20% or below, but uh, when the sort of potential future of the human species is at stake, this is uh, far too high to be comfortable. But um, we've been talking with some synthetic biologists and people involved in the security there, and there's a huge amount of uncertainty uh, uh, still. It might turn out that this field is reasonably safe and self-regulation will be enough, uh, but it may turn out to be completely the opposite. But that's the one that has the sort of, if you want, the most likely to strike, uh, in my opinion, at the moment. AI, the other one, is the one that's most likely to cause extinction. Um, because all the other ones, um, well, <laughs> to put it crudely, it's really hard to kill everybody. Um, no matter what approach you use, um, getting 100% of the human population is very hard. Getting 99% is very hard, but maybe if everything goes wrong, it might happen. But getting everyone is really hard. But if AI goes wrong and for some reason 99% of the, and because of that, sorry, 99% of the population is gone, then the remaining 1% uh, is definitely for it because it's, it's an intelligence adversary, so it doesn't get weaker as humans uh, diminish, rather the opposite. So those are the two risks. Um, as I say, so the one, the largest risk of disaster I'd put on synthetic biology and the largest extinction risk I'd put on AI. That's, that's very interesting because uh, it, it, it's interesting to me that you're ranking the risk of artificial intelligence higher than, for example, the risk of nuclear war and the damage, potential damage to 99 or even 100 percent, whereas apparently the risk that you put on nuclear war is considerably less than that. Um, Would you mind I, unpacking that a little bit? Okay. Um, I said that it has a higher extinction risk. Yeah. Simply S because it's, re as I said, it's really hard to kill any, everyone. A nuclear war, if you get the nuclear winter, that's incidentally, that is absolutely essential to get to all the casualties um, uh, that, uh, that you could get. Um, if you get the nuclear winter, the burning cities, there's various uncertainties in the models, uh, though uh, not as large as in some other fields. But if you get all the worst case scenario, the nuclear winter, the clouds, all that, you still cannot get scenarios in which you kill everyone or even when you get close to killing everyone. There always will be survivors in areas where agriculture will be possible uh, and where rebuilding can happen. So to get from nuclear war to human extinction, there's a series of other stages that you need. You need the population to be fragmented, maybe you might need a loss of technology, and then the population is vulnerable to other risks. So the, the AI is unique in that you don't need anything more um, after that. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest a little bit different consideration for the ranking here, perhaps uh, in the sense that well, you see, maybe you could be correct that AI will be the most efficient way to exterminate us, perhaps. But what about the fact that nuclear war may be in and of itself just a higher chance of happening, even if it's not so efficient way of exterminating us? And let's say if it kills 80% or 90% of us and destroys most urban centers, our industrial base of production and stuff, for all intensive purposes, it would put us back thousands of years, probably, right? And it 
as you said, it may even trigger that kind of chain reaction effect that eventually in the longer run can even lead to our extin extinction. So, uh, I mean, I, I personally myself and more in the short run am more worried about, you know, something going on in U Ukraine even more so than it has already, which has been a surprise to, to many of us. And then eventually this leading one step at a time to a World War III situation uh, as a higher risk in the, let's say, next 10 years than the chance of AI going rogue and killing us all. In the next 10 years, you're definitely correct. And though I haven't put um, sort of uh, firm probabilities on there, we prefer order of magnitude reasoning uh, when we can. Um, it's quite probable that the probability of nuclear war might be higher than the probability of rogue AI. Mm -hmm. um, but you've just sort of exposed the reason why we would really love to hire some sociologists or and some historians um, de-bias them as much as we can and let them loose on these problems um, because we just don't know what the odds of reconstruction. The scenario, just my informal reading of how states collapse and how rarely it happens and how much endures, um, it seems very improbable even after a major nuclear war that we are going to get a fundamental technological regression um, that is so popular in books and movies. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot lost. We've lost a, a complicated culture based on a lot of exchange and a lot of technology base. But a lot of the knowledge is immediately practically useful. Um, and people would fight to preserve the knowledge of how to build firearms, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, this is immensely valuable. So. And when you just look at what happens to states, states, I mean, it's not, anarchy doesn't break out. States might break into smaller groups. So you're still going to have organized groups, um, probably with some very senior people from various military uh, organization or from various political organizations um, leading them. Um, for instance, the nuclear, just the smallest example, the nuclear submarines uh, will still be around with very highly educated, technologically savvy people there. And there are going to be lots of survivors like that all across um, the globe. And so to really get extinction, you have to posit a lot of things that to me seem very unlikely and very contradicted by what happens in But it's mainly history. guys on the submarines. There's very few women. Oh yeah, but the thing is that <laughs> the, the nuclear war directly, even what you call it, the um, nuclear winter, is not going to kill sufficient people to put us on extinction risk. The, the submarines is more for the command and control and the, yeah, um, yeah. the knowledge. Uh, and just one silly example. Coal and oil are going to be very hard to get to, especially oil, compared with pre-industrial revolution. So doing another industrial revolution based on coal and oil is going to be much harder. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, aluminium, processed aluminium, which was very hard to get in the past. Now we've made it. It's all over the place. It's disposable. Um, it's going to be found in cities. Everywhere. So some resources are going to be very easy to find. Some are going to be very hard to find. And I just don't, I don't find myself from my non-expert overview of these, these similar situations, sort of outbreaks of anarchy and war and stuff like that, putting a very, putting a high probability at all that civilization will collapse meaningfully after uh, a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you have to posit maybe a lot more wars or, but yeah. anyway. Okay, let's let's move on here. Tell us a little bit about the mandate of the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford. Um, well, it's to look at the important questions is the informal mandate. Um, it's divided more specifically into looking at existential risks, some looking at human enhancements and a few other similar issues. But the, the real mandate is to look at the important questions where we can make a difference. Um, that's, those are the two reasons that we don't tend to look at climate change much. Uh, the first reason is that compared with the other risks, it's just not deadly enough. 
uh, unfortunate to mm. say. Um, and the second reason is that it, uh, it's saturated. There are people doing it all over the place. So we want to look most at the understudied, underappreciated risks where uh, we could make the most difference. Mm -hmm. Tell me about... The, uh... um, sorry, and also, I'm coming out of pessimistic and always focusing on the risk side, but there's also a lot uh, or some look at sort of the great potentials and the positives. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to look more at the risks, it's just how it, it ended up there, but there is some look at the po uh, potential positives. But um, though we tend to agree that ensuring the, probably the best added value that we could do is reduce the uh, existential risks um, rather than sort of improving the uh, improving the pr probably already a really good future that we would have if we survive. Very good. We're going to come back to that point about reducing the risks, but let me ask you first, personally speaking, what do you hope to accomplish in that field for the next, let's say, five years? And what's the sort of your biggest dream? <laughs> well, my biggest dream at the moment is that someone would tell me, turns out you've wasted your life. Uh, there is all your efforts are, are uh, pointless. It's all safe. It's all fine. You can retire. Um, so that would be a dream there. Then I could go off and do fun stuff. Um, well, you should talk to Peter Voss because that's pretty much what he said when I interviewed him. Sorry, um, they could say it in a way that I would believe. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have emphasized. <laughs> um, but so for the next five years, well, it kind of depends. I've got some progress in sort of anthropic probability, i.e. the what can we say by the fact of our very existence, some progress in certain AI ideas, um, quite a bit at sort of looking at predictions. And th th when you, the reason that I've been able to get so much progress in so many different fields, um, it, rather than sort of over specializing, is that there's so few people working on these problems. Mm -hmm. um, the ideal would be that there would be so many people at this that I could only contribute to a very narrow silo of ultra specialization. Uh, but I sort of go in different directions uh, because there are so few uh, people here and so many different opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't. So I'll probably continue in that vein. Uh, we're working with Amlin at the moment, a reinsurance company. Um, we're looking at uh, what we're getting from them is uh, a good look at how the the insurance, the reinsurance sector, risk looks analysis. At these, yeah, the the business risk analysis. Yeah. Um, and, and they have tons them. of data too. They do. Um, so we're going to be working on that project, for instance, and then ultimately also uh, in a variety of different directions. I don't know where it's going to go. Currently, probably AI because of uh, what I've uh, been telling you. But it's possible that we might find out that AI... W we try and do order of magnitude estimates when there's great uncertainty. Yeah. So that... Um, we can say this risk is not worth working on compared with others, like asteroid impacts. We now know enough to know that the uh, risk is sufficiently low um, that we can safely leave it to whoever feels like working on it. Mm -hmm. So maybe we might find something like that about AI and then uh, we can relax on that and just uh, l uh, go hard on synthetic biology. or or it may go in unexpected directions. So what would be something that you would believe? You said that you wouldn't believe if Peter Voss told you so. So <laughs> what would be evidence sufficient enough to kind of support that claim? To, to be strong enough to make you say, okay, it's time to retire, AI is safe. Um, hmm. Probably a series. What's the falsifiability of your approach, in other words? Well, there's the ultimate falsifiability falsifiability in that someone builds an AI and they do it without any care of security precautions and uh, it turns out to be safe. Uh, but that, that wouldn't mean that the next one would be safe, would it? Well, okay, we should distinguish the sort of super intelligent AI uh, in, 
Yeah, quotes. let's 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 start with the definition. Okay, let's start with the definition. What is AI in your opinion? Because every time I talk to different experts in the field, they kind of have a little bit of a different flavor of it. What's yours? Uh, we we tend to avoid issues of consciousness and in intelligence and all the words that people love to argue about, and phrase it in terms of human skills. So uh, an AI would be something in something artificial that would have the sort of general intelligence skill set that is comparable with humans. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's talk about the falsifiability. How do we know that it's time for you to retire? Um, okay, well, first of all, as I say, if someone builds an AI that turns out to be... Okay, um, the, the most dangerous AIs are the ones that are potentially extremely powerful through one route or another, maybe extreme economic predictions, maybe extreme social skills, those kind of things. Um, so if someone builds an AI that turns out to be extremely powerful and benevolent, to also be benevolent, or, well, I kind of define it as safe because okay. uh, in the sort of space of mind space, sort of safe and benevolent and good and perfect are kind of just all close together. All right. But, um, yeah, so, and it turns out to be fine, and then I can, then I can relax. Um, okay, that's the sort of ultimate false ability. In the more short term, it's if people start coming up with designs, uh, designs for AI safety that suddenly strike me as, yes, this could work. Yes, they've really thought of the problems, and yes, they've addressed the various objections. Um, let me push back a little bit here on both of those points, though, huh? Okay. So, 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 let's say that the first artificial super intelligence is benevolent or safe, as you say, but it's been developed at the University of Oxford, and the second one happens to be the one developed by DARPA, <laughs> right? Wouldn't that deny the possibility of you retiring? Or feeling safe about it, and and secondly, um, you know, other people can come up with say certain kinds of theorems or or programs that would, on paper, create safe AI that you can be convinced about, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you or them would be right in imagining mm -hmm. that they would be safe, would it? Mm -hmm. So for the first question, I'm imagining that if it is actually um, super powered in some way or extremely powerful that after the first one there wouldn't be a second one because the first thing that any benevolent AI it's kind of the most basic job description is make sure there's no non-benevolent AIs uh, built that would kind of be the biggest hole to leave um, what if it's a little more open-minded than me and you then I wouldn't call it a benevolent AI. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it's if it knew that a uh, if you knew that some some organization was going to do something extremely dangerous and evil, and you had the ability to stop it. Yeah, but you don't know that. All you know is that they're just building another AI, and what you're saying is it's going to shut down or or basically freeze all potentiality for reaching another AI. Uh, because it wouldn't take the risk, but that if, would presume guiltiness before proof. If it estimated that the risk of a dangerous AI was high, or I'm 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 assuming that it would probably be more accurate at this estimate than our, uh, than we would be. Um, so would be willing to let the project go ahead, maybe if if it thought that it was nearly certainly safe, but would stop it if it found that it it would be extremely dangerous. Just like if it saw that there was a chance of, uh, that there is a almost certainty of say a nuclear war within the ten yeah, years. Yeah, so there time. is some chance it would allow it to happen. Yes, but the point is that I would not be able to contribute anything useful at this point. Mm -hmm. If we are assuming that it really is super intelligent or super powered in some way, then its estimates would be much better than mine, um, and I definitely wouldn't be able to convince it to do something that it otherwise wouldn't do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic, fascinating. And the other option about uh, uh, basically believing your own or your colleagues theories of creating a friendliness feature 
embedded in the AI, but actually not having a way to prove it before you do it. And then you may post factum discover that your theory of friendliness or uh, programming uh, of the friendliness feature was flawed. Hmm. So I definitely also want some sort of theory of why I want to be stable under bugs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Since we are definitely sure that there will be bugs, I wouldn't want the whole thing to depend on absolutely perfect coding. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's all about probabilities. It could be wrong. Um, the question is just, can we drive it down far enough um, that it's either not worth worrying about anymore compared with some other risks or that it's worth risking because of other risks because there is a we shouldn't forget the positive I, I said survivable but I think that any AI that's survivable is also going to be wonderful and all the positive things that you want as well um, because I said about nuclear war I said about synthetic biology a super powered AI uh, that is benevolent would be one of the best tools to prevent this from happening. So if, for instance, you thought there was a 10% chance of a nuclear war in the next decade, and that you had an AI that had a 1% chance of going wrong, but could prevent the nuclear war from happening, then this seems like the sort of risks that are probably worth running. Anyway, the, those numbers are just uh, for illustrative sense. Uh, Stuart, so in terms of making AI safety, there's been a number of appro uh, AI safe, there's been a number <laughs> of approaches that have been proposed by people. Uh, so what do you think, for example, of Steve Omohundro? Uh, his, his proposal to have uh, provable, safe mathematical systems, uh, or what he calls AI scaffolding, as a way of uh, uh, creating safe artificial intelligence? Um, I'm not confident that it'll be ready on time. I'm not confident that it'll be able to be applied directly to whatever AI design is being built uh, unless uh, AI designers um, start taking the risk a lot more seriously. And I'm not entirely convinced that it would that's a mathematical model that when it would be grounded in the real world that it would necessarily work um, as intended. That said, I think the most, the most progress we can make along that axis, the better things will be. Because when you, when you get a mathematical proof or a solution to a particular problem of the AI safety, you can then sort of take that problem out, out of the equation. Um, so that's what I think the biggest contribution of that would be. More and more problems would be get taken out of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, like MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, yeah. uh, their big uh, thing at the moment is to keep an AI's motivation stable as it makes copies of itself or self-improves uh, or those kind of things. And if that succeeds, which... I, I'm feeling pretty confident, having seen some of their work there. But then that removes really? that removes well for that narrow problem. But that removes that aspect of the problem. So it's not something you need to worry about then that you, your motivation may get lost, and then different people may remove different aspects of the problem. So that the the bit where you have to sort of use more heuristic methods or train it or hope um, are reduced as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, that the approach by Miri is kind of the best approach we've got so far? Um, Yes, um, in a certain sense. Um, as I say, I don't think that it will get to the end of its program on time. Um, that AI will probably be developed before um, the 
the secret of friendly AI is cast into mathematics and uh, is unambiguous and clear. But um, I think they're contributing the most um, to AI safety uh, of any group I know. Roman Yampolsky, for example, is another researcher who has been writing about leak-proofing the singularity and creating a sort of a digital sandbox, if you will, where with a number of different layers behind which we can supposedly safely create AI. Or I mean, I like the idea, and we have sort of Oracle uh, AI idea. We had a paper a few years back on that. And those are the sort of things that it's really good to do anyway, um, but I wouldn't hold out a huge amount of hope for them uh, just on their own, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because suppose you're a really nasty AI and you're in this sandbox environment and you can, since you're intelligent, you can figure out that you're in a sandbox environment. What are you motivated to do? You're motivated to play nice until such time as you're not in a sandbox environment until you have potentially a lot more power to affect things in the world. Mm -hmm. But now let's suppose you're a really nice AI in this sandbox environment. You're also motivated to be nice until such time as you're free in the world. So when, within the sandbox environment, you might be able to catch some of them, um, but all AIs, all sufficiently smart AIs, whether nice, nasty, or the most likely dangerous, lethally indifferent, um, will be behaving in the same way. It's sort of a convergent goal. So, again, yeah, you should definitely do it, but I wouldn't count on it, especially because this is the sort of description that you would do carefully with the first AI in the lab, maybe. But then when you ha announce the world, we have AI, um, the pressure is going to be to actually do something with it. And then at that point, you're going to be in much more insecure environments. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you this, though. Uh, you keep saying that AI is very dangerous, but I've interviewed a number of experts in the field who say that we're not anywhere remotely close to ever creating uh, AI, or at least in the next hundred years or the foreseeable future. So, for example, the father of artificial, the, the quote, father of artificial intelligence, our, end of quote, Marvin Minsky, said we haven't made any progress for the last 30 or 40 years whatsoever and not only that but in his opinion nobody is actually really working on any substantial ways uh, or methods of creating artificial general intelligence at all. Uh, Noam Chomsky agreed with that uh, estimate maybe for a little bit different reason but at any rate, he, he agreed that all the progress has been made in narrow AI and, and nothing has been made in terms of progress with respect to artificial general intelligence. So, so aren't we creating a straw man here, something that doesn't exist and that many experts in the field say we're not ev even closer to it becoming reality and yet we're fearful so much of it? Um, well, we're, we're not really fearful so much of it. Uh, I think we should be a bit more fearful uh, than we are. But um, the first of all, I've done actually research on why AI predictions are really terrible um, to simplify the things. Um, there's various reasons why people predicting AI will not give good predictions and when you plot them sort of expected dates for instance it's all over the place and there's strong evidence that they don't really they're not honing in on some sort of genuine fact so that's my own personal impression too even though I haven't had your scientific approach my personal impression after doing a number of these interviews is that experts are all over the map like all over hmm. and I mean there's possibility that we could develop a general intelligence uh, within the next few years if some algorithm turns out to be overpowered. I mean, we already have the AIXI, um, a algorithm that would be the smartest possible being in a certain sense. It's absolutely impossible to build even in principle. There are computable approximations of it that turn out to be useless only in practice. Um, but that could have turned out to be powerful, uh, unexpectedly good. It 
wasn't. So I don't think we should dismiss the idea that we might get a general intelligence soon by a smart algorithm or combination of different narrow AI things in some, in some way. Um, I don't think it's particularly likely, but I don't think we can safely dismiss it. Well, and that's like, I think Marvin Minsky would say that that's something like randomly coming up with the human brain in a Petri dish by chance. Uh, I'm not. I'm not thinking randomly. Um, I'm thinking of. I mean, you could, you could say that. Say some people are developing machines to try and pass the Turing tests, for instance. Sure. Some people are developing machines to pick stocks effectively. Yes. All of these would benefit from general intelligence. And so this general intelligence may be developed or a certain portion of general intelligence problem may be solved in the process of doing this. And there are a few people actually working on AGI, and I suspect that there actually are a few more people working on AGI who don't announce it and don't tell you and say that they're working on very narrow. But that's the, 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 that's the sort of the uncertainty answer. The uncertainty answer also is, by the way, the explanation. I never said that a dangerous AI is overwhelmingly likely. I just think that the probability of a dangerous AI um, is uncomfortably high, especially because we know so little. But the other aspect is that um, it's going to take, you, you were talking about Omohundra's approach, uh, which is akin to Miri's approach, yes. the sort of proper hard math, yes. hardcore mathematical solution of human value. Yes. Well, the more time that has to run, the more likely it is to, to succeed or to get important sub-problems solved. So basically the time to start working on AI safety is, well, I, I, I would say it's now, but it's actually sort of 40 years ago. But the fact that it's getting started now gives us, well, the earlier we can get it started, the better. Mm -hmm. but, but what if the people who develop AI actually ignore those methods <laughs> developed by Miri and Omohundro and decide well, to all, do it on their own. First of all, it's better to have developed the methods anyway um, because then they'll be aware of it. It might be around in the literature. There's a slightly higher chance that they might be. Um, I've also noticed that you can get people to take a problem more seriously once you've solved it. Um, so if you say... Um, I've been sort of working on reduced impact AI, which mm -hmm. is an avenue I think may hold fruit, which is the basic idea of if you give AI instructions, it'll obey those instructions without sort of optimizing the whole world um, out of control in order to get them. Um, but so, so, so that's... Uh, how, how should, how do I phrase it? Um, <laughs> um, yes. So, yeah. So there, I'm coming up. I'm coming up with better ways of. Some people have sort of a value loading approach, uh, though they use different terms, where AIs learn the correct values. Yes. I've been looking at how do we ensure that the AI is motivated to update its values um, in the way that we want them to and to not try and manipulate things so that it updates them in a particular way. I think I have a solution of that and once that's out, um, I think people will be more willing to talk about the problem because it has actually been solved and can be the solution can be understood and implemented or critiqued. Um, and, and I think in general, the more problems that are solved, the more people are willing to admit that they were problems. Stuart, I have so many things I want to ask you about that, but unfortunately we only have about three or four minutes left before I know you have to go. So let me try and rush it a little bit here in the end and ask you a few questions to, to throw out probably with, with quick answers if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, What's the chance of survival that you'd give us? You're all about probabilities. What's the probability of survival that humanity will have in the context of artificial superintelligence? 
of artificial super intelligence. Um, I'm always amazed by the answers people give me. I can't remember, but I think Michael Onisimo either gave me 20% or less or something real small that really shocked me. Um, I'd currently go for around two thirds uh, survival chance. 66%? Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, though this this number fluctuates a lot based on, because there's so much uncertainty, based on sort of recent discoveries. But the point is you think we're actually, more likely to survive than not. Actually, I probably, let me boost that up to, or boost it down to about 50%. Um, okay. Because it's about 60% it's about for AI in general, uh, but for actually super intelligent one, I'd put it at 50, say. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it can it, go either or. Yeah. Um, in either case, the sort of probability of danger is far too high for me to be relaxed about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you wouldn't sort of... There's very few activities that you would do that would have a 33% chance of death that you'd be willing to engage in. Mm -hmm. And this is a 33% chance of the entire future of the human race being extinct. Um, if, if AI had no real advantage, which is not the case, then you probably would not want an AI unless the risks of human extinction was below a millionth of a millionth or some absurd number like that. Because it does have advantages, you need to trade it off against other risks um, so that at least, so that basically if you, think, if you think we're pretty safe from other things, you would not want to build an AI unless the risk of death was minute. If you think the chances of nuclear war or bad synthetic biology were quite high, you'd probably be more willing to turn on an AI with a higher chance of um, extinction risks just because it could protect us from the other risks. Stuart, what's the best place for people to find more about you and your work? Um, on the FHI website, uh, on the Less Wrong website, on the FHI Oxford YouTube channel. Uh, you can look up some of the papers that we've written uh, in uh, Google Scholar Search or, or other Scholar Searches. Um, I think that's about, that's about it. My final question is this, what's the most important uh, message that you'd like our viewers and listeners to take away from you? Um, that there are very important uh, problems uh, and that it's really worth working on these problems uh, if we can and that the smallest change in an important problem outweighs huge amounts of other good uh, that you can do in the world. Um, you don't need necessarily to work on them yourselves. Or you could support other people who work or, or um, put pr political pressure in certain directions or something like that. But there are, there are problems that are orders of magnitudes, massive orders of magnitudes, more important to solve uh, than others. And just diverting a little bit more attention to these areas will bring huge benefits. But what, what's the good news in all of this? I, I, I mean, is, is there any good news? Because, I mean, you're telling us about those huge problems, those the, the sort of the huge downsides of, 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 of you know, AI or ASI going wrong rogue and, and exterminating the humanity in the most efficient way possible to to imagine, right? So is there any good news in all of this? Oh, there's a lot of good news. I mean, if we don't get whacked by these existential risks, <laughs> um, the future is probably going to be uh, pretty wonderful. Um, this is a whole other conversation. It's talking about trends and stuff like that. There's lots of positive trends, lots of negative trends, but the negative trends get reported all the time and the positive ones don't. Um, so overall, if we don't get hit by these existential risks, um, things are going to probably go very well in most areas. And there is a wonderful future uh, for humanity out there, and it's to protect that wonderful future that I spend all this time worrying about uh, the bad stuff. Fantastic, and this is, I think, uh, the point that I'd like to bring our conversation to to an end, and let us ponder about this because I like sort of the the direction and the open-endedness and the hope that it gives us. Thank you. It's been nice talking to you. Singularity.